Good morning. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, one day conference on the economic development uh, uh, in Tibet, the implications, economic and military uh, implications of uh, China's expanded railway line on the Tibetan plateau, the status of the Tibetan language, the fate of the Tibetan nomads and how Tibet figures uh, in India-China relations uh, and the environmental importance of uh, the Tibetan plateau to uh, Asia and by implication to the rest of the world. And finally, we have uh, Xi Jinping and his uh, anti-corruption uh, campaign. Uh, we, are, we would like to thank uh, the TPI, would like to thank uh, Kalil Tiji for uh, uh, giving the inaugural uh, address. Uh, we are also deeply, deeply uh, grateful uh, to Professor uh, Indy uh, Ye, who has come uh, all the way from uh, America. She is our main speaker and uh, she'll be the one who will guide us uh, through uh, trying to make sense of a very complicated uh, situation uh, uh, in Tibet. And now uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, invite uh, Kalim Tiki Choyang to give her in all the address. Good morning. Welcome to Dharamsala. Despite a broken leg, <laughs> appreciate the hard, long travel. Um, I think today is probably the first time since I've become Kalun that I've been given an opportunity to uh, say a few words about uh, the situation um, inside Tibet related to economic development and uh, environmental policies. I left uh, Tibet 10 years ago uh, after spending almost 10 years both in, um, in inland China as well as in uh, Tibetan areas. Most of it I was fortunate to travel to all three traditional areas, but most of my time was spent in uh, Eastern Tibet in Amdo, and uh, a lot of my work uh, in community development uh, was with uh, rural communities. So based on that experience and um, the development since then, um, I'm going to share a few thoughts with you today. The Tibetan landscape is changing very fast and undergoing uh, reverse, reversible transformation. It's affecting the lives of all Tibetans on the plateau. We as Tibetan, whether inside Tibet or in exile, need to hold more discussions about non-overtly political policies, but which nonetheless will significantly impact the future of Tibetan society and the environmental state of the plateau. What are the links between economic development, environmental policies in Tibet and those inland in China? Are they unique to Tibet? How do they tie in with the greater political policies that the Chinese government has in mind for Tibetan areas? Most Tibetans, as you know, in Tibet, still live in rural areas. Uh, rural areas meaning farming communities, nomadic communities. And this despite the fact that the number of Tibetans living in urban areas such as Lhasa, Xining, Chengdu, Beijing is increasing rapidly. And so is the development of peri-urban areas such as the prefectural seats in all the Tibetan areas. Most Tibetan farmers now, and traditionally, depend on 
uh, rain-fed agriculture, very few have uh, access to cash crops. It's subsistence farming, rain-fed agriculture, and uh, several of them depend on um, cater collection of caterpillar fungus, and also with a large number of infrastructure projects, also join in um, the different uh, groups or worker teams that are um, hired as manual laborers. They've also been very uh, much impacted. The rural Tibetan areas by uh, the doing away of the traditional uh, job assignment uh, structure. In the past, In the past, uh, most of the Tibetan rural communities relied heavily on their investment in their children's higher education and the hope that they would be given uh, state jobs as cadres to claim their share of what we refer to as the iron rice bowl, where you are assigned a state job and your housing and everything is taken care of until your retirement. Uh, that system away now has been eliminated and that has also deeply impacted uh, the Tibetan rural community. And today, you know, I speak a lot about the Tibetan rural, rural community because um, that's where my heart is, that's where the, where the majority of the Tibetans live inside Tibet. They, it's a rural population still. Environmental-wise, um, you know, when I was in Tibet, I remember um, now we're hearing about mining and water projects and all of that. But when I was in, living in Tibet, I remember uh, being in uh, the prefectural seat of Rekong, uh, known as Huanan Prefecture. And there was an aluminum factory uh, near the prefectural seat. And in the vicinity of that factory, um, the cattle, livestock, humans were losing their teeth and uh, people knew it was related to the aluminum factory but um, nothing was being done about it and later on when I spoke to environmentalists here they were saying that uh, aluminum factories when there's an excessive emission of fluoride that's what causes the loss of teeth and so you know it's so important for Tibetans to be aware of it, of these, uh, the impact on uh, both the human and uh, general population around these large projects. Uh, I'm hopeful in the sense that the level of literacy and education in Tibetan, uh, in the Tibetan population inside Tibet is increasing, uh, perhaps not as quickly as we hope, but it is increasing and there are more and more educated young Tibetans who will hopefully be in a better place to address the impact of these environmental projects on their local community. Um, in exile, I think that it's important that we talk about these different policies. It's difficult to say how much we can influence them, but I think that in terms of environmental policies, I really think we can make a difference. Uh, although we don't have necessarily the resources to have a complete set of technical data. Uh, I think that just the fact that we can raise international awareness and also awareness amongst the neighboring countries can uh, influence uh, the development and the implementation of environmental policies on the Tibetan Plateau. The irony when discussing these policies is that, you know, on one hand, uh, we in exile are free to discuss them, but difficult to say to what extent we can influence them. Um, whereas in Tibetan, uh, in Tibet, uh, I'm sure that Tibetans of uh, different sectors of Tibetan society have a very good understanding of these policies and their impact. Mm -hmm. 
but then again, they live in a political environment where it's very difficult to have candid and transparent discussion about these policies. And I personally experience the, the type of restriction uh, that is imposed and suspicion, because when I was working in Tibet, I remember the authorities would be suspicious as soon as there were, uh, even if it was just five or six educated Tibetans getting together to discuss something. They were immediately suspicious about the agenda and the purpose and what was discussed. And this was before 2008, so I suspect that it's probably even harder than before to have this kind of discussion, but uh, it's so important nonetheless to, to, to have this discussion and hopefully when we have them in exile, somehow it's also um, uh, being shared uh, through uh, RFA, VOA and the different Tibetan media which broadcast inside Tibet that this kind of discussion is taking place in exile. And I think what the importance is that it remains on the agenda and we keep discussing them and flagging them and raising uh, the importance of uh, these policies. There's also the issue of the, what is the role of the privileged within Tibetan society? This is constantly a question that I have when we are faced with the policies inside Tibet and the situation in general inside Tibet. When, when I say privileged, we are part of that privilege in the sense that mm -hmm. we live in a free world. What is our responsibility as people enjoying that kind of privilege? But also inside Tibet, um, not all Tibetans uh, live in rural areas. There's a privileged class there are the economically privileged, the business community. There are those who are more educated, the intellectual uh, class. And then there are those who are the politically privileged, the political leaders, uh, the cadres. And then there are those who are uh, socially privileged, the religious leaders, the tukus. What is our role as the privileged class within our Tibetan society to mitigate um, the negative impact of these policies, to influence these policies, to influence the development of future policies. And I think this is a question that we must constantly ask ourselves. There's a figure that uh, we have been um, circulating, and I think it's an important figure to bear in mind and that's the Tibetan community in exile is 2%. 98% is inside Tibet. And so whenever um, we do things here, I think it's very important to remind ourselves how is it benefiting the 98% of us. And uh, through the creation of uh, institutions such as Tibet policy, uh, Institute. Uh, I, this is um, an initiative, an effort by the Central Tibetan Administration to create a platform where uh, policies related to Tibetans inside Tibet can be uh, spoken uh, as policies uh, and as much uh, as possible with emotional detachment and looking at the policies objectively and then inviting uh, people like Ms. Ye to come and share uh, their years of research uh, with us so that it can complement the information that we have access to here. To illustrate uh, the changes that uh, are taking place inside Tibet, I never forget the saying that Tibetans used to tell me when I was in Tibet. They would say, uh, the Tibetan nomad is becoming a farmer. Uh, the farmer, uh, no, the, no, the Tibetan nomad is becoming a farmer, the farmer is becoming Chinese, and the Chinese is becoming the devil. So it, this was a saying to illustrate the social, economic uh, changes that were taking place. Um, 
dopa shiba chagores, shiba gya chagores, gya de chagores. So this is, um, uh, you know, it was very accurate actually in terms of the, you know, the, the changes that we see, the nomads are becoming more sedentary, uh, the Chinese, uh, the farming areas uh, more and more are um, moving to urban areas and uh, becoming more Sinophyte. So um, to close, and I'm going to say a few words also in Tibetan. Um, I just want to, uh, again, thank TPI for the opportunity to share a few thoughts today uh, through this inaugural address, and I want to thank uh, Emily Ye for traveling all this long distance. I had a chance to look at uh, the uh, document listing all your papers and research. It's very impressive, and I think uh, it's wonderful that you were able to travel this far and for this short a stay, and so I really encourage all of you to make the most of it through the question period and through the context that you'll be having uh, through tomorrow. I guess you're leaving tomorrow afternoon, right? Um, Manzo her Mansolan Shimju Tanjingje Pugetonina, uh, the engine 
呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,
from the, from the story in the news at that time, which was that all Chinese were moved there, right, in this sort of deliberate population transfer. So I was interested in that. Um, I was also interested in the fact that Tibetan villagers were renting out their land when they were making far less money renting out their land than they could, than the Chinese farmers were making. And I was curious why they would do that when there seemed to be an obvious economic rationale not to, and an obvious political rationale not to, right, is that this, um, this domination by Chinese migrants. So I started to ask Tibetan farmers, um, you know, why don't you grow your own vegetables? And, and things that people said um, were summed up, for example, in one, one farmer who said, quote, to plant vegetables, you have to have a lot of patience. You must get up very early in the morning and stay up late at night. Tibetans don't like to do this kind of work. And again and again, people said this kind of thing to me. So this was the puzzle that formed my initial study. Why were people doing this when they could make more money and also dominate the market themselves, right? And why did people explain this in terms of their own work habits? And I just want to be very clear here that I'm not um, making any kind of claim that Tibetans don't work hard. That is not my argument. Um, and it, I don't think it's true. What I'm interested in is why, in a particular political economic context, right, they would mobilize this kind of explanation for their place in the economy. So this, uh, these interactions over land in the 1990s form um, as I continued to do work in Lhasa over a period of a decade, one of three key moments that I explore uh, in the transformation of the landscape from the 1950s to the present. Um, and in the book, I use the term territorialization uh, to describe this longer process. And that's drawing from some political geography literature, which is, um, you know, I think different from how most policymakers think. But it's a, about thinking about state territory not as naturalized in a sort of Westphalian system, but as always an ongoing process, right? How does it, how, what happens to make those um, certain state boundaries seem secure at certain points in time. It's always ongoing. So I see three key moments in territorialization in the book, and I call these soil uh, on, the, on the right here, a um, uh, picture from Xinhua, referring to the 1950s. Um, and that part uh, explores the set setting up of scientific, so-called so scientific agriculture. The second part, plastic, referring to the plastic um, greenhouses, and the third part, concrete, um, and that is about the 2000s, when you know, I kept going back to these villages, and over time, some of them just uh, were paved over, right? They had become urban. Uh, so I look at those three periods of time. This first part, I'm not going to really uh, talk about in the interest of time, but basically um, what I'm interested in here is the um, July 1st and August 1st state farms, which are on the outskirts of Hassa and were the places where the People's Liber Liberation Army first grew grain to deal with the food shortage um, that was uh, in place for them in the early 1950s. And I'm interested here in the Maoist uh, vision of the environment as something to be conquered, right, which can be seen in, in the slogans and um, so forth at that time. Uh, also, in this part of the book, I, I interviewed a number of uh, now, by then, very elderly men and women, um, many from poor households, Tuchung households um, around Lhasa, as well as from Kham. And these were early workers on the farm, right? People who had been um, convinced to work on, on these farms in the early years. And I, I try to tease out some of the... Um, the contradictions they faced, right, many years later, um, thinking back on their participation in these activities. Uh, in the second part, again, I turn to the question of Chinese migration and the growing of vegetables as the push, part of the push towards development in the 1980s. And this is just one photo I took from uh, Pumburi, which is across the Kichu River. Um, of that landscape. This is the landscape uh, around the year 2000. And, and what was curious to me was, you know, in most of these villages, this is just east of uh, the urban center of Lhasa at the time, uh, you f I, I found more that, that in most villages there wasn't a single household who had not rented out some of their land. 
Um, and also that, um, you know, the migrants tend not to bring their kids, but in terms of the sheer number of households, right, couples, there were often more Chinese households than Tibetan households living within the confines of a village. And so that was the, the puzzle that I, um, that I set out to look at at the time. Um, so thinking about development, um, you know, during the Maoist period, one of the two narratives of legitimacy of the, uh, the Chinese state was the idea that Tibetans should be uh, you know, grateful for socialist liberation. In the 1980s, this shifted from liberation to development, right? So development was the new thing to strive for. And just as in the earlier time, Tibetans were sort of blamed for not being advanced enough in their progression to socialism, um, now they are seen as not uh, being too backwards and not market-oriented enough, right? So they're always seen as lacking in some way, but what they're lacking kind of flipped, right? became the opposite. Uh, now, the political economy of development in the, you know, what's now the Tibet Autonomous Region um, is too long to discuss in this talk. It's really what Andrew Fisher um, focuses on, and I hope he's able to come at some point. But I just want to mention one uh, issue that I think is very important, and that is the Chinese state, the central government, has sent in massive amounts of money into Tibet, but that it's, um, it's a very distorted kind of subsidy structure. So that by 2010, for example, direct budgetary subsidies from the central government exceeded 100% of GDP growth. So that meant if you put in $100, right, of direct subsidy money, the GDP grow, grew by less than $100, right? So it's a very uh, distorted kind of aid dependency um, that characterizes the economy. And the other thing is that most of the subsidies are spent on out-of-province construction companies, right? So it's this contracting system where the government will say, okay, we're gonna spend this much money to build a road, but they will give that contract to, for example, a Sisquanese firm, right? And then that company will bring in all of its equipment, all of its labor, right? And then that, that money kind of flows back out to, through those laborers uh, and their wages and equipment back out of the province. So before the 1980s, officials in the TAR felt pressured um, to say that, you know, any Chinese migrants who came in were sort of special technical personnel, special cadres or something. But after the 1980s, and particularly after 1992, um, there was a shift in the discourse um, where now any Chinese who comes in is seen as automatically a win-win proposition, right? Again, by the government. Um, and the idea here, again, is that migrants are more entrepreneurial, more market-oriented, more scientific, and that their mere presence in Tibet will um, kind of help Tibet develop, right? So that's the, that's the logical, that's the justification um, for it. Now, the migrants that I interviewed, um, tracing their own presence back. Most of them come, you know, they don't come because the government says, you know, you will go to Tibet now. We will pay you this much money to go to Tibet now. They come because their friend, their cousin, their older sister, someone from their hometown has come. And if you trace those, um, those ties back, usually you can trace them back to one of uh, just a few things. One is um, sometimes you can trace them back to soldiers Right, Chinese soldiers who were stationed in Tibet at some point for two or three years, saw the economic opportunities, went home after being decommissioned, and then went back for some sort of market opportunity. And then they brought all their friends with them. Uh, or members of construction teams. And so you have a lot of Sichuanese construction teams who are sent there and then come back on their own as migrants um, to do other businesses or as government officials. Um, and when I asked the migrants, you know, why did you come here? Interestingly, a lot of them, and, and it's a very specific, geographically specific migration. So, so most of the migrants in uh, Tibet are from Sichuan province. Sichuan province is also the largest province, uh, the province that sends out the most migrants all over China. But a few specific places really dominate in the migration to Tibet. And, you know, they'll say things like, well, it's the most, it's the place I've, I can make the most money, right? Um, in, in China. Um, 
And one of the things that, that was interesting to me, and I think makes you know, the situation complex and difficult to deal with, is that um, the migrants themselves, so, so I did a lot of interviews with Tibetans who were renting out their vegetables about what they thought about these specific Chinese they were interacting with. And I went to their Chinese sending areas and, and interviewed them about you know, what they thought about Tibet. And what um, is kind of sad but, um, and ironic is that even though the migrants are in a structural sense the beneficiaries of these massive subsidies that the Chinese state is pouring into Tibet, they see themselves as being unfairly treated, right? So the migrants think the Chinese government is unfair because it's pouring all, these money, all this money into Tibet and it's not giving it to our hometown, right? So they resent the development in Tibet. I mean, and people in Tibet also resent the development in Tibet, right? So it's a, it's a situation where uh, those migrants don't see that they're kind of ben benefiting, right? And instead think that they're on the losing end of this, uh, of this situation. It's not, um, in some ways, it, it strikes me, and my reference point is the US, of course, but, um, you know, white people in the US are often resentful of, um, affirmative action opportunities for minorities, right? And they don't see that actually this is, this is a structural um, kind of issue. So not, not a, an exact parallel, but, but a little bit similar in that they're benefiting but, but are resentful of the Tibetans. So, um, oops, I didn't need to do that. So in doing my research with Chinese and Tibetan migrants, uh, uh, sorry, Chinese migrants and Tibetans, um, I came to see, and I won't talk about this in detail, but I came to see that the question of why Tibetans are renting out their land and saying, well, you know, we can't grow vegetables because we don't want to work that hard, like that, that I couldn't understand that only from a simple economic point of view, right? And I also couldn't understand that only from a simple political point of view, which is that they don't like these migrants here and yet they were doing this. Um, and instead, I see it as overdetermined by a lot of political, economic, and cultural political factors that work sometimes at smaller scales than we might see from a distance. Um, and that these all kind of contribute to each other. And part of it has to do with the way that land is distributed um, for villagers and the way in which uh, migrants can come in easily because they don't have ties within the village um, to consolidate land that's difficult in a way that's difficult for Tibetans themselves to do it because they're embedded within a certain set of village or, uh, social relations already in the village. I saw that other things that matter are how people remember the Maoist period, right? The labor that they had to do then versus the labor that they don't have to do now. Um, it's also partly an assertion of ethnic identity, right? We do this to make ourselves distinct from the migrants. And it's also a part of the way in which I, I argue that social and spatial patterns actually embed and um, make each other. So this village is a representation of a pretty, um, this map is a representation of a pretty typical village uh, in the early 2000s. So the, the big squares in the middle are the Tibetan houses, right? That's a, um, the village center. The rectangles are the green, represent the greenhouses, and the little black rectangles represent the very temporary shelters that the migrants um, build for themselves. And what you have is that these migrants come in and they don't live actually anywhere close to the Tibetans. They live on their, they live right next to their vegetables. And if you start to look at how people move through space, right, the pe where the people in the village center go to their fields go to Hlasa for circumambulation for older folks versus where the migrants walk. They actually, even though they are living within the confines of, within the space of a small village, they actually don't interact with each other very much. And, and they knew surprisingly little um, about each other. So again, that's not that surprising, but what it means is that, you know, it's one piece of evidence that the government's idea that the mere presence of migrants will mean technology transfer simply doesn't work, right? Because they actually don't interact with each other in any significant way. And finally, in this part of the book, I also explore ideas about indolence and ideas about being spoiled, not as you know, a reflection of what people actually do, but rather as a way in which they experience what Chinese development is about. Now, in the last part of the book, um, called Concrete, I turn to urbanization and to house building. And this part explores 
how ideas of the urban and the city in China have really become, again, especially since the 2000s, have become as the, un the site of modernity, the site of progress, like what you need to do to be a, 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 a modern individual. And um, part of this work, I look at urbanization and processes of land expropriation that are both similar to and different from urbanization um, processes that take land away from farmers in other parts of China, and be, I'd be happy to talk more specifically about those property rights. But what I try to do here is also explore the ways in which um, the urban urbanization is not just about building taller buildings and building and putting people closer to each other, right? There's that technical aspect to it, but I, I argue that it's also um, a particular kind of disorienting lived experience, right? And I explore how people understand that experience. And again, I think urbanization everywhere, here in India, in the United States, whatever, is partly about that remaking of your um, lived experience. But, but what is different in Tibet, of course, is again, um, the way that it's understood, not just as urban, but also as a, a new Chinese way of living. So part of what I um, do is um, I give this, uh, this vignette um, from uh, about an installation art piece by an artist named uh, Pemba Chundra who, um, who did this very interesting art piece. And I, I don't think I have time to read it now, but, but he, he did this art piece um, where he put a pink Michael Jackson next to two you know, Chinese New Year's figurines and then put them in a cage in front of the patala and then watered it. And he has this whole set of um, uh, long explanation about what this symbolizes. And, and basically it symbolizes uh, this experience of you know, being Ramandu, right? Being not this or that, and this kind of in-betweenness, this hybridity that he then links to urbanization. Um, so I, I have that um, as a way of expressing that sort of um, uh, structure or feeling, if you will. And I can, I can return to that, but I'm running low on time, so. So what I want to spend the remaining 10 minutes I have on is this last topic, which is this massive wave of house building that's transformed the landscape since 2006 um, under the name of the new socialist countryside. So nationally, um, across China, the new socialist countryside was announced as a top priority in 2005. And it's actually, you know, if you read the text, it's, you know, it, it makes sense. It says, let's, let's redistribute income to rural areas. Let's um, uh, close the widening rural urban gap. Eliminate agricultural taxes, and the, the government did do that. It wasn't relevant in the TAR because those taxes had already been eliminated. But across China, agricultural taxes were eliminated. Um, extension of the rural cooperative medical system, relief of tuition fees, and so forth. Now, nowhere in the national program does uh, house building play a role in the new socialist countryside. But in the TAR, until recently, house building was the centerpiece of what happened under the new socialist countryside. So in Tibet, in the TAR, uh, what's now called the TAR, um, it has happened under what's called comfortable housing, right? And this is a program that um, was supposed to build new houses or retrofit old ones for all Tibetans living in the TAR other than in the city, right? Peri-urban, rural, whatever. And uh, in 2010, the government announced that it had completed 80% of the buildings. Um, and they further reported that the government had spent 500 million US dollars on this program. So this program has, of course, been very controversial. Um, so according to one newspaper article that was published in the US in 2006, uh, they described it as follows, quote, in a massive campaign that recalls the socialist engineering of an earlier era, the Chinese government has relocated one-tenth of the population from scattered rural hamlets to new socialist villages. Um, Human Rights Watch, for example, has very heavily criticized this. Um, the Chinese state, on the other hand, of course, says this is a great program which has raised the standards of living and accelerated development. And one thing that interests me or that caught my attention was that this housing program was tied to this idea 
of development as a kind of gift to the Tibetan people, right? So for example, a white paper in 2009 by the Chinese State Council stated, quote, thanks to the central to the care of the central authorities and the support of the whole nation, Tibet has witnessed remarkable progress towards development. And it, then it goes on to talk about um, uh, the housing. So according to the Chinese government, right, there's been a gift of housing. Of course, according to most critics of the government, that whole idea of a gift is completely ridiculous. Um, but what I try to do is to ask what it would mean to really take the idea of a gift seriously. Right, um, and so someone on Amazon.com trashed my book because of the, the it had gift in the title, and I, I don't think they actually read what I said. So you know, I, I I recognize the the possibility of being misinterpreted here. But what I'm doing here is I'm saying, well, let's think about the gift the way anthropologists and social theorists have. And one thing that is interesting is, um, for example, anthropologist Marcel Moss, who has wrote a lot about the gift, said that you know, if you trace the idea of the gift back in Germanic languages, it has two meanings. It means present, right, the way we usually think about a gift, and it also means poison. right? So he says it's a, two, it's a double-edged sword. And what he means by that is that when you are given a gift, you are also bound in a, in a relationship of reciprocity. When you are given a gift, you owe someone, who, the giver, something. And if you want to be in that relationship, then you know, it's not so bad. But if it's a relationship you are not actually that interested in being in, then it can really be kind of uh, dangerous or, or at least uh, unpleasant. So it's about being in a relationship of obligation. Um, and building on this, um, another, and I, I'll, I'm going to get a little bit abstract here, and I, I apologize, but Jacques Derrida um, writes that um, the grammatical formula of the gift presumes a, constitu a, a subject and a verb, a constituted subject that seeks to reappropriate its own identity. In other words, if you have a gift, then you have a giver, and you have this imagination of the giver as a person or a thing. And what I'm trying to do here is link this idea to what a lot of um, political theorists have called the state effect. And that is that uh, you know, the state is really a, an abstract idea, right? It has real effects. It matters in people's I lives. But if you try to go and like point to something like the state and that's completely separate from society, you actually can't find it, right? Because it's an effect and it's an effect of power. Um, and so what I argue is that the, the um, idea of, the, of, of being a Tibetan given a gift implies a recognition of a Chinese state and a relationship with that state that you might not actually want. But once you have accepted the gift, you're kind of bound in that relationship. And I argue that this helps us explain what are sometimes actually very um, contradictory ways in which people think about, talk about, and engage with these new housing programs. OK, so uh, turning back to just the, the program for a second, you know, why $500 million is a lot of money, right? Um, think of how many you know, nice roads you could build here on that money. So why is it so significant? Um, so the, the party secretary of the TAR at that time, Dong Ching Li, is credited with creating a theory, like, you know, all good Chinese leaders, he has a theory. And he, he theorizes that housing is a, a breakthrough point or an incision point. And his idea, um, which was presented to, to me by another official, was that, quote, the changes in the living conditions um, will drive changes in their basic way of thinking, right? Um, so his, he said, you know, first, um, Tibetans will get a good place to live, and then they'll think about all the things that they need to buy to decorate their houses, and then they'll think about you know, going and working harder. So it's this, this idea, right? this assumption that Tibetans are not market-oriented enough and that by giving them a house, they will go and participate in the market in a particular kind of way, which may not actually be possible <laughs> given the broader structure, but, but that's the, the way, the logic that officials have um, when thinking about the program. Now, of course, there is the other political logic, which is um, closely related to this, where at the very same time that they say, well, this is going to make Tibetans more market-oriented, they also say um, that this will uh, you know, 
uh, have Tibetans recognize that, um, you know, the Dalai Lama, for example, hasn't, quote, um, and I, I'm quoting here from a government official, you know, he repeats over and over again whatever about human rights, but uh, despite his decades of uh, such things, he has not contributed a single brick, cow, or penny to the rural masses of Tibet. So what we have here is a discursive shift, right, where they're saying human rights is not about the ability to say what you want and practice what uh, you know, your, your beliefs tell you, rather human rights is about having material goods, right? So there's that shift in, in trying to redefine what human rights are. Um, and it also signals this relationship between development, gratitude, and sovereignty, where once you're recipient of a house or some other kind of material gift, you are required, whether you wanted it or not, to perform your loyalty, right, to the state or else be labeled a political splittist. And so what it, what it creates is this sort of right, painful requirement to act, perform in one way, even if you may think something somewhat different. Okay, so back to the um, actual implementation. So there, first there's an outright subsidy, right? There was um, a base <laughs> subsidy of, of 10,000 roaming the almost 2,000 US dollars. Uh, then depending on where you were, the municipality sent, put in more money. The county sometimes put in more money, so it, depended, it depends on the place you are. Certain rules are imposed on the uh, building of houses. So for example, across the TAR, one of the rules was that livestock should be separated from people, right? So the traditional building structure is to have a you know, barn on the first floor and then people upstairs, and they said, no, in the new houses, the barn has to be separate from the house, and this is supposed to be for hygienic uh, purposes. In, other places, um, other kinds of rules were implemented. For example, in Lhasa municipality, they said there has to be seven square meters per person, so a certain size was necessary. And then in other places, um, other kinds of rules were imposed. For example, um, in Dulunde Ching County, mud bricks, the traditional um, construction material, were not, was not allowed, and only granite or concrete was allowed. And in general, what we see is that the closer to Lhasa or the closer to a main road, uh, the, more, the more visible it would, you know, the house would be to, to passers-by, um, the more rules were imposed, right? So very much about this logic of, well, if higher level officials come to visit, what are they going to see? Um, now, oh, thank you. <laughs> the, the subsidies um, generally, uh, in addition to the subsidies, there were also three-year loans that were, was given by the government. Um, but even then, the total amount of the subsidy in the loan was generally not enough to build a house. And again, this depended. In some cases, the government, uh, local government officials actually said, you know, if you're a poor household, don't build a house that's any bigger than what you can afford. In other places, they were encouraged to build much bigger houses. But all in all, people tended to take out private loans on top of, so loans from their, you know, from people in their social networks rather than, um, rather than just using the, the government um, subsidy. So um, this issue of debt was a tremendous, is a tremendous source of anxiety that I found for villagers. Um, so what's interesting here is that when the loan to the bank comes due, right, the bank will try to recover its loan. They'll go to your house and they'll say, you know, they'll try to pressure the, your, your people in your village and say, well, you know, make that person um, pay back their loan, they'll use social pressure. But ultimately, what's interesting to me, maybe, you know, being an American and thinking about foreclosures, is that here, foreclosure is not a possibility, right? The government, although it may come and visit you and try to get its money back, it's never going to take your house away from you, right? And that's because there's no established legal rural housing market. Um, Houses do not have a market value in rural areas. They do in urban areas. They don't in rural areas. Um, so they're not really commodities in the way that houses in a, for example, in the US are or in urban China are. And I argue that instead of being governed by market logic, they're instead governed by the logic of the gift. So the possibility of being forgiven a debt, the monetary debt, which many of people I talk to were hoping for. They were like, well, we can't really pay back the loan, but hopefully the government will just 
forget about it and say we don't need to pay. But of course, what that does is it makes turns that debt into a, a gratitude debt again, an obligation to perform a certain kind of subjectivity, even if you might not believe it. So, and indeed, a, a United Front official wrote in a document to the government that it recommended completely. Uh, I'm almost saying, completely forgiving the debt, right? So that, quote, this benevolent project of comfortable housing will sit at the bottom of their hearts. So I'm totally running out of time. So basically, in terms of what actually happens, it, there's a lot of variation. Uh, it's really different from place to place. The closer the village is to a main road or to urban plaza, the more restrictions on building materials, size of the house, location of the house, and so forth. In some cases, um, new houses have to be built in orderly rows. Um, you have to demolish your old house. In other places, you can build your house uh, wherever you want. You can build another house if necessary. So let me just show you a, a few pictures of different variations. There are a number of cases, and this is one, where it's actually land expropriation. It's land expropriation that's very similar to what happens in other parts of China, where people actually lose their land. Um, but here, it's like land expropriation that's called development. And I, I can talk more about how that works. Um, here's an example of houses built kind of, you know, in a straight orderly line by the road. This was a new road that was built between Lhasa and the airport. And here people were told, you know, if they lived a certain a distance from the road, you have to build a new house whether you want to or not. Built a new house last year, too bad. Take it down, build a new one, right? Um, so that's one variation. But in other places, um, you had very different things where, here's an example of where villagers were told that they couldn't keep their old house, right? You have to, if you want to take part in the program, they were not required to, you had to get rid of your old house. What they did here was that almost everyone divided their household in two, right? So there were 300 households before, and then after this program, all of a sudden the village had 600 households. And so what they did was they, everyone said, oh, our household, we're really two different households, right? And so they, they got a new household document, and then when they, the new household didn't have to build one, the old household did build one, so all of a sudden everyone had two houses. And this was a way for people to think forward, oh, my son or daughter is gonna get married, they're gonna need a house, what am I gonna do? Let's do it this way, right? So people were here um, able to take more advantage of the program, if you will. And in still other places, um, in some villages, for example, in Pembo, um, a lot of villagers actually wanted to build a house, but there wasn't enough subsidy. And so there were a lot of allegations of corruption where people said, oh, you know, the, the, the township leader ate all the money. And so you, you had three or four households dividing up the subsidy that was originally for one. So it really varied from place to place. But what I'm, I'm you know, so part of the story is simply that it depends. And that's the story that, for example, Mel Goldstein will tell you um, about this. And he's written about this as well. Um, I want to say more than that it depends. And I think that there are, despite these variations, a few commonalities. Um, one is, um, you know, and that again centers around this issue of, um, of anxiety about debt, right? Which I think, again, is, is really less of a real monetary anxiety and more of a, like, my relationship to the Chinese state anxiety. The other thing that's, uh, that I've been trying to think about is the question of voluntariness, right? And this is a, a big political question where the government says, okay, this, this housing project was 100% voluntary. And then at the same time, they say, we've reached 100% of our target. And so you have to wonder, right, how does the um, government target come to align so perfectly with the desires of, of residents if they're voluntary? Part of the ex explanation is very simply that um, I think with all programs in China, you have to realize that what they say they have, they've achieved is generally not what they've achieved. So any kind of, you know, we've reached 100% is probably not completely accurate. But beyond this, I think there's something more going on where people would tell me very contradictory things. They would say, the leader said that everyone must build a house. And then later he would say, everyone wanted to build a house, right? So how do those two things happen at the same time? Um, I think one woman uh, explained it as saying, you know, I, I asked her, is this a good project or a bad project? And she said, well, of course it's both, right? Because everyone likes free money, or who doesn't like free money? And indeed, a lot of people saw this as an opportunity to capture some free money, right? A gift. Let's take advantage of it while we can. 
But she said, you know, everyone was thinking only of taking the Communist Party's money, but instead everyone ended up hugely in debt. And I think that captures uh, the contradiction at the heart of, of the program and of development more generally. So in conclusion, my, my argument is not that the large scale provision of housing and development more generally is sometimes a present and sometimes poison, but it's always some kind of combination of both in this situation. So people around Lhasa expressed simultaneously resentment or anger at the government, fear of financial indebtedness, and enticement of the opportunity to capture a gift from the state, right? They saw it uh, taking advantage of the state almost as an act of agency, while at the same time um, being bound to recognize themselves as in a relationship with the nation state um, and obliged to perform loyalty. And this, of course, comes into clearer view after 2008, right? So after um, 2008, villagers around Lhasa who had either participated in the unrest or had families who were arrested um, were said, were told, okay, your project subsidies are canceled. You can no longer take part in any projects. You cannot, you are no longer eligible for water, electricity, or other services. Um, and we have, of course, seen this dynamic intensify since that time. So, for example, in Repgung, um, recently decrees have said that um, there's a permanent cancellation of all welfare benefits, disaster relief aid, and livelihood benefits, not only for anyone's family for, with someone who has self-immolated, but also anyone who visits, donates to, other, or otherwise tries to console their families. Villages from which anyone who self-immolates have come are also to have all state-funded uh, development projects uh, immediately canceled. So we see this logic very much at work, where the gift of a house, I think, is an example of a larger um, understanding of development, right? It's a, it's a power that tries to foster a certain kind of improved life, but it's always linked in this context with indebtedness, and thus ultimately being relegated to what has been called the state of exception. So I'll stop there, because I've gone on way too long. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.